UFC Mexico takes place this weekend, and we're going to break down every single fight on this card. I am 138 MMA. All of my links are in the description, so be sure to check those out. Let's break the down the fights. up next. Mohamed Naimov takes on Eric Silva. Silva's 4-1 and one in his last five fights, 5-0 and oh for Naimov. Now, for Eric Silva, he's pretty much a grappler. Uh, can he strike? Yeah, I mean, he's a human that has his limbs. He can strike, but he's a grappler through and through, and that's what he's looking to do. He's got decent takedowns. When he gets the fight to the mat, he's a back taker looking for that rear naked choke because that is what he gets. He gets a lot of rear naked choke finishes. He is very much a rear naked choke specialist. He does use his ground and pound as well, though. He'll use it to set up transitions, submission attempts, etc. And the elbows are what he likes to use the most, and he does a good job with them. So Eric Silva, grappling is where he wants this fight. Now he's fighting Mohamed Naimov, who's shown that he's a lot better than people thought originally coming into the UFC. The guy's got de good wrestling with decent takedowns. But when he gets on top, he's got a lot of control. His own takedown defense can be suspect, but if he gets the takedown first, getting hit, getting on top of his opponents, he's usually good at staying safe and doing what he needs to do there. In in the striking department, he's got plenty of power, and at range, his kicks are actually really good, and I think that comes from a uh, Taekwondo background that I believe he, he, he has. He showed in his last fight that he's a bit of a dirty fighter. He blatantly cheated quite a few times in that matchup, and I think that could be a good thing or a bad thing. And in this matchup, I'm going to say it's probably a good thing because I do think it's going to help him out in the grappling situations if he ends up in a rough spot. For me, I've got to take Muhammad Naimov, and I think it's clear here that he's probably going to be the better fighter, and I think he's going to get this one done. So for me, Muhammad Naimov is the clear pick. Let me know what you have, though. I would love to hear from you in the comments. I'll see Flyweights you next. next in this action-packed matchup. Victor Altamirano takes on Felipe Dos Santos. Dos Santos, 3-1 in a no contest in his last five, 3-2 and two for Altamirano. This is a well-matched fight here. This is going to be a, this is probably fight of the night right here. This, this has fireworks written all over it. Felipe Dos Santos, very good striker. He's going to come forward with a lot of pressure, volume, slamming leg kicks. Um, he's got very good knees and, and front kicks up the middle, and he can string that into a flying knee as the fight goes on. He does get a bit wild, and his defense can be, you know, non-existent at times, but he's durable and can eat shots, as we've seen in that matchup with Manel Cop. He ate some shots, kept coming forward, and actually made that a pretty close fight. Uh, in the grappling department, he's got good Brazilian jiu-jitsu, decent takedowns that come at the end of his strikes, which is impressive. Uh, he does have a really good butterfly guard. So from his back, he starts to get those butterfly hooks in, and he can use that to elevate his opponents, whether that be to get the sweep or to just create space and then create a scramble. Whatever he wants to do there, he's good with it. Um, he's a little bit more submission over position, and that's okay because the way that he fights, he's looking for kills, looking for finish, not looking for uh, control time, right? Um, his top control, like I said, is not that good. On the other side, Altamirano, good striking. He's got plenty of power. I'd say he probably has the more power of the two. Um, he's got, you know, he's got that accuracy that goes along with it. It makes him seem even more powerful. Um, he's got good combinations. He mixes his punches and kicks together very well. The volume is there as well, but he also lacks in the striking defense department. So both guys are hittable. Both guys are wild, but one's just a little more on the clean. One's more on the uh, aggressive, dangerous style. So that's what you get there. Altamirano's got pretty decent uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu as well but he usually uses it to get back to his feet because he is a striker at heart. For me in this matchup, I will have to lean Felipe Dos Santos, but something I really like, I saw it today. The under two and a half was at plus 200. That's insane. I think this fight ends before we, we get to two and a half pretty, at a pretty high clip because these guys are going to be all action. And the way that these two fight, somebody's got to get it, right? Um, I understand it could go to the decision with the, the altitude thing. You, like, that's the thing. Sometimes people get tired and they just can't get the finish. We saw that with Salt Lake City. Uh, you know, it's just the way it is. But I really think that if you run this fight 100 times, gosh, like 75% of the time, 75 out of 100 times, you probably get a finish under two and a half just with the way that they both fight. So I'm going to take Felipe Dos Santos. He probably gets a finish. But if he doesn't get the finish, Altamirano probably gets the finish. That's what I'm looking at. I know Felipe Dos Santos is tough as nails, but it's just the way that these two are going to fight. I see that coming down. So let me know what you have. Let me know where you're at on this one. How do you line up? And I will see you guys in the next Next, time. Luis Rodriguez takes on Denise Bondar. Guys, if you don't know, Thursday at 9.15-ish Eastern Time PM, I'll be going live with the Couch Warrior to break down Bellator versus PFL champs card. So you're going to want to check that out. We're not doing a, the marker board breakdown for this one. Unfortunately, I understand. It's just, it's a lot of time commitment to write all this stuff up here, record it, edit the videos, all that stuff. It's a lot. And there's going to be a lot of PFL and Bellator content this year. Every Everybody last year, everybody and their mother last year was begging me in the comments, 138 of May, 
please break down PFL fights. Please, we need it. We need it so bad. I understand. I get it. I hear you. I hear your cries, your pleas. I understand. And I'm going to do it. But we, we just, with the contender series, with the UFC just having a ton of cards, you know, we don't have the same time commitment to put into it. So you're not going to get the deep analysis like you get on the full UFC cards. And under, I understand that you used to get that for Bellator. So now you're like, what, we're losing that? But you, you're, you're getting a knockdown on the Bellator and you're still going to get a quick breakdown of the fights. But you're getting a step up because you're getting the PFL. You didn't get that before. So be ready for that. They're going to be lives. I'm going to try to have a guest on most of them, but not necessarily all the time. It's going to be enjoyable. Me and the Couch Warrior, we, we, we have a good chemistry, right? We go back and forth well. It'll just be the two of us for this one. You guys are going to love it. Couch Warrior is great. I'm, you guys obviously think I'm at least all right if you're here on the channel. So there is that. So be sure to tune in. I know that we're going to break this down. Don't worry. But 9.15-ish p.m. Eastern time, Thursday night. If you haven't already, if it's not past that, that's when it's going to be, okay? So let's break this one down. We've got Luis Rodriguez. Denise Bondar, flyweight division. Bondar's 3-2 in his last five. 5-0 five oh for Rodriguez, which is a good, good bit of momentum there. Bondar, on a bit of a, you know, rough run in the last couple, right? Uh, but he does have solid wrestling. He's got solid takedowns. They're very powerful. Pick guys up, puts them down hard. You know, that's what he does. Got good scrambles. He's a back taker. Back taker um, and he's going to attack the submissions. That he, This is what he needs. He's also got a good trip, and he, or, yeah, good trip from the clinch. That's pretty good as well. That kind of lumps in with this because he's not doing a lot of damage in the in the clinch often, but he's looking for the trips. He does have good control there. So these these things kind of lump together. We're, we're just going to do this. So it's like this is kind of what you're seeing when it comes to the grappling department, and that's what he does. Uh, in the clinch for Bondar is basically a grappling situation. Now, when it comes to striking, it's not very good, but it's powerful, and he wings a big, powerful, heavy overhand. Defensively, he's got a good high guard. But he's very kill or be killed in his fights, whether that be on the grappling department, on the feet, whatever. Bondar, he, he's hard to rely on, but he does have some upsides in some of his skill sets. For Rodriguez, he's a good striker. He's good from either stance. He's going to cut off the cage. He's going to try to counter his way through the fight, uh, which can lead to him being just a little bit too low of output a lot of times, and I don't like that. You can be too patient waiting for his opponents. I don't think we got to worry too much about that here, though. Because Bondar is kill or be killed. I've already said that. So when you take a guy that is usually too patient because he's waiting for counters, so we're going to do that, and you put him against a guy that's kill or be killed, 2 plus 2 equals 3. And yeah, I know it's supposed to equal 4, but it equals 3 in this matchup because it's broken. What happens is the too patient, negative plus a negative equals a positive. Guys, you're learning math with me today. And uh, Luis Rodriguez is now no longer too patient, but he's just patient enough because it's going to lead to Bondar making some mistakes, and he's going to be able to use those counter shots, and he's going to be able to use that power, and he's going to be able to land some shots against Bondar. And I think on the feet, Rodriguez is the big favorite. Now, when it comes to the mat, he's got decent takedown defense, so he's going to need to keep this up. But if he doesn't, I think on the mat, Bondar is going to have a lot of success. So we do have to worry about that on the Rodriguez side. If you haven't get, uh, gathered this by now, I'm on the Rodriguez side. I can't trust Denise Bondar anymore at all. Uh, you'd have to give it a give him a pretty favorable matchup for me to take Bondar at this point. I'm going with Luis Rodriguez. I think he's going to be just what we need in this matchup. As an underdog, I think he's going to be able to land the counter shots. I think he's going to be able to, to get Bondar to come in, try to land a big, powerful overhand, get countered, sparked, dropped. Maybe we get an early finish, but I definitely think the under two and a half is a live thing. Maybe they're giving us one and a half, and if so, that's uh, maybe don't touch that one. But under two and a half probably hits. I don't know what it's lined at. I, don't, I didn't look. I should have looked. But yeah, Rodriguez is the pick. Let me know where you're at. Are you on the Bondar side? If you are, why is that? Do you think it's the grappling? Because that's about the only thing I can see, but maybe I'm wrong. Let me know. You learned some math today. I appreciate you guys. Let me know how you're doing on your math stuff in the in the in the comments below. I'll Riker see you guys. Versus next Grappler in the lightweight division. We have Faraz Ziam taking on Claudio Puelles. In this one here, both guys are four and one in their last five fights. It's interesting because a lot of people are really down on Claudio Puelles, and a lot of people are really high on Faraz Ziam now because just the way that the momentum has shifted. But both guys are four and one in their last five, and that's something to make note of. Uh, for Faraz Ziam, the guy's a solid striker. 
He puts together good combinations. He mixes his punching, punches and kicks together very well. He's got good movement on the feet, incredibly accurate with his striking, sticks the jab, but the problem is the output. His volume is very non-existent at times, and he just doesn't put enough volume out to really, to really uh, you know, get get the ball rolling with those strikes. He's very clean in the striking, but he can get beat by guys that just put more volume to him. But, like I said, he's 4-1 in his last five, so he's doing fine. But that is the biggest knock on him in the striking. Now, I think he's going to be the far better striker here, so I don't know that that's really going to be too big of an issue, but it could because even a poor striker, if they're throwing more shots at you and you're not doing anything, you're going to lose. But in the grappling, he's decent. He's got long limbs. He likes to just wrap up his opponents and control so that way they can't do anything to him. Um, he does a good job with that. He's got good choking arms, but, you know, he's not really a, a grappler by trade, but he will get it done if he needs to, and his takedown defense is not that good. Now, on the other side, where this? Jiu-jitsu entirely, right? This guy is a jiu-jitsu guy. His striking, not very good. It's, I, would, I say poor, but it's, it's not that bad, but it's not good, right? He's got some, you know, some decent, I don't even know if it's decent. He can throw strikes. Let's put it that way. It's not like he just can't strike, and it's not horrible, but it's not good, and he's going to be the far worse striker in this matchup, and I really need to make sure I get that point across. But in the grappling, he's going to be the far better grappler. If he can get it to the ground, he's positionally sound. He's got very smooth transitions. He's always looking for the submissions, and obviously he's a big leg lock guy. We've seen that from him. He attacks the knee bars, attacks the heel, he, attacks the, he just attacks the legs. But the problem is he lacks the open mat takedowns to get the fight to the mat. Tough fight to call. I don't recommend partnering with your hard-earned money on this one. This is a tricky one because it could go either way. It basically just depends who's able to keep the fight in their realm. And I'm going to take Zium. And normally I side with grapplers, but I just don't like this. Right here, the lacking of open mat takedowns is a big red flag for me. And I've got to take the Farah Zium side. So we're taking Zium in this one. Let me know where you're at in the comments below. Like the video while you're at it. And I will see you guys. tired of breaking down this matchup. So let's just hope that this is the last time that we have to do this. We have a flyweight matchup between Edgar Chavez and Daniel Lacerda. Daniel, he's got a million names. Daniel Lacerda is what we're going with. Uh, Lacerda is 0-4 in a no contest in his last five fights. Says all that you need to know about that. 2-2 uh, two, two in a no contest for Chavez. Not the best either, but, I mean, it's got wins. So that's a, that's a step in the right direction. We saw this fight. We saw a conclusion to this fight, essentially. But they said it was a no contest. Either way, he should be 0-5 in his last five fights. Uh, so in this one here, Daniel Lacerda, he's a good striker, with very aggressive, comes forward, powerful. He's going to spin a whole bunch. Probably not the best move, but sometimes it pays off. He's very kill or be killed, and his defense isn't good. On the other, on the, uh, other realm of things, his grappling is he's aggressively attacking submissions. That's about what we can say. He can get stuck on the bottom. Um, he's got a, a laxed level of cardio. He does gas out very fast, but I think it's mostly just because of the output he puts out. And also, this is going to be an elevation, so that could be a problem for him. Cherez, good striking, good forward pressure. He's got a blitzing style, good kicks, plenty of power, sticks the jab well, but his defense is a little bit iffy as well. When it comes to the jiu-jitsu, he's got a very large toolbox, and he's constantly attacking submissions. We saw him get the, the uh, standing guillotine on Lacerda last time, and it should have been a finish, but it wasn't. It was no contest because he, you know how it is. He, it, yeah, you know what's up. Either way, I got to go with Cherez again. I think he gets it done. Probably getting the finish. Probably under one and a half, maybe, but it's just completely overpriced. So I don't know. Maybe just put Char Charez in some uh, Charez in some parlays. That's where I'm at. Let me know what you think. There are a lot See of flyweights on this card, and I'm here for it because I love the flyweight division. Absolutely exciting, and this matchup should deliver just like the rest of the flyweight uh, fights on this card. We have Mateo Mendonca taking on Jesus Aguilar. This is a good one. Four and one for Aguilar in his last five. Three and two for Mendonca. He has not had the best run in the UFC, but he's fought pretty good competition though thus far. And I think this is a matchup where he's going to have some physical advantages that might kind of level the playing field, right? Five six with a seventy one and a half inch reach is going to be an impressive uh, advantage for him over five four with a sixty two inch reach for Aguilar. So for uh, Mendonca, if he can use that natural advantage, I do think that's going to kind of give him that boost he might need to get his first win but he's going up against a guy who's got all the momentum on his side instant knockout in his last matchup so it's going to be a good one right and this is the only fight so far uh on the card that at the time of recording they have not released an over under on the rounds yet so i imagine that they're going to probably line this one really really nice and like for the for the bookies and it's going to be really not nice for us so probably not going to be a lot of meat on the bone but if they give us a good line on the under two and a half it's a spot to play.
Uh, Mendonca here, he has good striking, good power. He's got kicks to all levels that are pretty darn solid kicks. He can either be the guy initiating or sitting back and counter striking, and he does well with both. He got, he's got good combinations, but the problem is somebody gets into a brawl, and in there, he's wide open to being countered. Uh, in the grappling, powerful takedowns. He's a big slammer type of guy. Um, he's, he's got these takedowns at the end of his strikes, and he also is going to be attacking submissions the entire time he's on the bottom or on top even. The problem, though, that's what got him last time. He would not just let go of that stupid leg lock, and he got beaten for it. So it could be a problem for him. He does kind of fade as the fights go on because he fights at such a high pace. So that could also be a problem for him here in Mexico City. There's a lot to like about Mateusz Mendonca, but there's also a lot of things that, that you know could be red flags. So on the other side, Aguilar. Biggest red flag is that reach. That is a very small reach. Um, but Donza just has a freakishly long wingspan for a guy that's 5'6". So take that into, into account. Uh, so for Aguilar, good wrestling, right? He's going to shoot a lot of takedowns. His scrambles are very good. Um, he's got good sweeps as well, but that guillotine. That is, is, that is his best weapon. Is, he is a guillotine specialist to the uh, highest degree. And that's what he's looking for in most fights. Now, in this one... That's going to be interesting for him because I do wonder if Mendonca is going to shoot a takedown that will put him in a position for that, that guillotine or if he's going to be forcing Aguilar to strike with him. And if he does, I think Mendonca has the better striking. But Aguilar's not bad. He showed he's got some power in the hands, right? He's a good forward pressure and he throws a lot of power shots. But we haven't any, seen any real power. So when I say power shots, I mean he's winging bombs. But we haven't really seen that power translate into knockouts until his last matchup, which looked pretty good. Uh, he's a bit wild on the feet, though, and he is open to counters in his own right, which is why I think this fight should go under two and a half rounds if they give us a good line. Like I said, we'll play it. If it's under one and a half, just pass, because one and a half in a flyweight fight is a little scary unless you've got Daniel Lacerda. Now, I'm going to take Mendonca to get this one done. I think the natural advantages are going to play out well for him. I think in the striking, he's going to be a little bit better, and I think in the grappling, he's going to be good enough to, to hold his own. He might give up position. He might make a few dumb mistakes. But I don't think he's getting caught in a guillotine. And for me, that makes Madonza the pick. I think he gets it done inside the distance, probably by a TKO. Let me know what you have, and I will see this you guys. The weights here. We have Jaroni Barcelos taking on Christian Quinones. Quinones, 4-1 and one in his last five. The reverse is true for Barcelos, 1-4, and four, which is crazy because the guy is 17-5 and five on the career. 1-4 and four in the last five. That means a lot of his losses are very recent. Barcelos, he's showing signs of decline. So I'm going to talk about his skill set. But you got to just take this and understand that it's kind of working downward, right? He's a solid wrestler. He's got very good takedown entries, good scrambling ability, excellent takedown defense, a massive jujitsu toolbox. He's a good striker as well, very solid in his Muay Thai base. He's got power, combinations, leg kicks. But like I said, he's getting older. He's in his mid to late 30s. What are you, like 36, 37, something like that, 36? I should have wrote that down, but I didn't. Uh... But Barcelos is getting up there, and we just haven't seen him perform at the level that he was just even a few years ago. Uh, he did get knocked out by, by Nurmagomedov, which, you know, no shame in getting beaten by one of the best in the division, the guy that nobody wants to fight. But it's just the way that he got knocked out. Durability is going to start to decline. We saw that with Volkanovski, unfortunately, at our last event. And as fighters age, it's just a, it's a cruel sport, right? So for Canones, he's younger. He's got good striking, good forward pressure, knockout power, and he likes to get in a brawl. These are all bad things for Jaoni Barcelos. Christian Cononez, good wrestler as well. He's got solid takedowns. He does get a little submission over position, but he's young, athletic, and I think he can, he can, he can do that, especially early in a fight, and that's not a problem. His takedown defense is a little bit, you know, because he'll, he'll get a little aggressive on the feet and then can get taken down from there. Barcelos' best path to victory is getting this fight to the mat early and often. I gotta take Canones, and I believe he's still an underdog, but we've just seen it too much lately. The older guy, even if they are the more skilled on paper, they're the guy that should win the fight. If you just look at the skills, they're just not getting it done. So I'm going to take Christian Canones here to beat Hione Barcelos. And it does kind of pain me a little bit to do that because Barcelos is one of those guys that you like you think of as he he's just just outside the rankings. He's you know, he's this, he's he's that, he's he's a real litmus test for guys, but it's just kind of hasn't been there lately. So I'm taking Canones. I'd love to hear from you, though. Do you think I'm, I'm overestimating the downfall of Barcelos based on what we saw at UFC 298 with Volkanovski getting knocked out? Is that what I'm doing? Am I, am I 
Am I taking what happened to one fighter and putting it on another? Or am I accurate in my assessment? I'd love to hear your opinion in the comments below. I appreciate it. Still, we've got Manuel there. Torres taking on Chris Duncan. Now, Chris Duncan, 4-1 and one in his last five fights. He's looked great ever since getting in the UFC, uh, as far as wins go. But the performance has just been kind of like, you know, he's getting it done. But either way, uh, for Manuel Torres, 5-0 and oh in his last five. He's had electric performances recently. So that last performance he had where he just shut that poor man's lights out with that elbow, fantastic stuff. Torres looks great, but that doesn't tell the whole story, okay? Because Chris Duncan, he's done what's needed to get done to win fights, and he's taken a style that he had before where it was getting a lot of brawls, which he is good in a brawl, as you see. But he's mixed it up and said, okay, I need to do what I got to do to win the fight, and if a brawl is not the way to win this fight, I'm now going to mix in the wrestling. So... We've got, a, we've got a better fight IQ Chris Duncan than we had on the regional scene or that first run in the contender series. And I think that's going to gonna help him out a lot throughout his UFC tenure. So for Chris Duncan, he's got he's good to brawl, like I said. Pretty much a, just a decent striker with power, leg kicks, and brawling ability. His striking defense is still poor. His hands are still low. But he does have the wrestling wrinkle in the game that where he can push guys up against the cage and just control them there and just land enough to just win minutes. And he does a good job at that. I think in this matchup with it being a fight at elevation against a guy like Manuel Torres, who's such a fast starter, that could be a good path to victory for him. Slow the fight down, wear on the guy, see if you can get, you know, suck on some of that gas tank a little bit. Probably not a good idea. Don't suck on gas tanks. That will kill you. But uh, in this matchup, it's, it's the, it's the idea to, you know, get the guy worn out. So for Torres though, like I said, he starts fast. He's probably the better striker as far as delivering his tools to where they need to be. He's got power. He's got volume. But he gets a bit sloppy at times, and his striking defense isn't very good either. So either guy could get put out. It's just the way that it is. Torres is probably the, the more durable guy at this point in the career. But then again, who knows? Duncan's only been put out that one time. He's only lost once. Uh, in the clinch, Torres has the advantage in the open mat clinch. And what I mean by that is like your tie clinch or your one over one under uh, wrestling style clinch, stuff like that. He's the, got the advantage there, and he just lands these absolutely deadly elbows and knees. And that's something I really like about him. But his kill, or be killed, his kill or be killed style can be a problem for both him and his opponents. Ultimately, I've got to side with Torres in this one. I think he's probably the more dangerous striker. He's definitely the more dangerous striker. He's, you know, working out of a, 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 a more familiar environment to him, right? They're Mexico. That's going to obviously give Torres an advantage over Chris Duncan, who's from, what, Scotland, right? Am I right about that? Um, either way, you gotta go, I got to go Torres here. But I could see a, a fight where if Torres isn't able to get him out of there early, Duncan spends a lot of time just pushing pushing Torres up against the cage and winning a greasy like 29-28 decision where he wins round two and three with a lot of cage push. So keep that in mind as you're placing your bets this week. But I'm going to take Torres. Let me know who you have in the strawweight matchup next. Yasmin Hauregi takes on Sam Hughes. Hughes is three and two in her last five, four and one for Hauregi. Now this is an interesting matchup because the undefeated streak of 10 and 0 came to an end for Hauregi in her last matchup where she was just floored immediately into the fight. And how is she going to bounce back from that? Because that is kind of just something that it, that alters your, your psyche, right? Because you go into these fights, you're undefeated, you're feeling invincible, and then you just get flattened in no time, right? So do you come into the next fight kind of worried about your chin? Do you come into the next fight just thinking like, man, maybe I'm just not durable like I thought I was? We've seen her go to war before for, for 15 minutes and just go at it and and nothing, no big problem. But she got cracked and just put out. But thankfully for her, she's fighting Sam Hughes, who is a good fighter, but just isn't like a, a power puncher. That's not her That's not her go-to, right? She's not a big, heavy power puncher. So for Sam Hughes, she does have decent wrestling. It's, you know, it, she's she's an athlete is what she is. And because she's such an athlete, she ends up being a decent fighter. Um, she's got decent takedowns. She's got good control when she gets it to the mat, but she's not so good off of her back. That is the one area she really struggles. Um, in the striking, she's decent there as well. It's the volume. She's putting forth volume. And it's not even like combinations per se. It's just a barrage of shots that are just coming from, whether they're single shots thrown in succession, which you would think is a combination, but it doesn't feel like it. You know what I mean? Um, but she's also very durable. So she's just volume, durability. She's the type of, of person who, who as an underdog, beats, beats these, these fighters that have a lot of quick finishes, a lot of like, you know, a lot of hype behind them for getting things done early, and she just outpaces them. But she's going against Hauregi here, who we've also seen show a lot of cardio. So I don't know that that's going to be the case, 
But she could win a volume battle here, although Hauregi's got good volume herself. I'll cover that in a minute. Either way, Sam Hughes has some of the better pacing and cardio. She's just putting out high output. She's got she's just going for it. And in, in this division, she's probably one of the best at that. So that is her skill set, is just weaponizing her physicality, her ability just to be an aggressive athlete. For Hauregi, she's a solid striker. She's far better striker in this matchup. She's cleaner, she's got better combinations, excellent counter shots, very fast hands, and she puts forth a quite a bit of volume herself. So the striking, Hauregi all day. The grappling, she's got good grappling as well, and we've seen that. She's got decent takedown defense. It's actually pretty good. Um, and she's got a good body lock takedown of her own. I think she wants to keep this on the feet. That would make sense. She should be able to stand at range and just pick apart Sam Hughes. But I could see her mixing in that body lock takedown because, at, you know, at times, Hughes can just put forth a lot of pressure. And just getting someone like that to the mat and getting top control time, it, it gives you a break from that pressure. And even if you're beating somebody with the counter shots, sometimes your brain needs a just a little like, oh, finally, we can just give ourselves a minute and not have to try to counter the shots coming our way. So I could see her mixing in the takedowns and doing that like, you know, the last minute of a round here and there in this matchup. And ultimately, I do think that she's going to have the better better tools and the path to victory. Yasmin Hauregi probably gets this one done, but Sam Hughes is going to be a willing dance partner. And I think that in a place such as Mexico City, where there's going to be a pretty high elevation, this is going to be a fun fight because these two ladies both can go for the whole 15 minutes, even at this elevation. And I'm confident in that. So for me, how ready is the pick? Let me know who you have, and I will now see you in the bantamweight next. division with a couple of fighters who are still early in their UFC career. We have Raul Rosas Jr. taking on Ricky Tercios. Four and one in the last five for Rosas, three and two for Tercios. Rosas faced a big level of step up uh, in competition early in his career in the UFC. Didn't pan out for him. Came back, got a win in his last fight. Looked a lot better, but it was against a big drop off in competition. So now we're kind of in the middle, right? Uh, better than the last competition, not quite at the level of the one before that. And Ricky Tercio, he's he's had some up and down performances. Uh, he's on the Ultimate Fighter, did well, looked pretty good in there. Really close fight with my guy Brady Heastan that I thought maybe could have edged that one out, but I'm also a little biased there. Um, but you know, Tercio, he looked pretty good in you know in the Ultimate Fighter season. Had an odd performance after that where he just threw a ton of volume but didn't land like anything, which was super strange. And here we are. Now Now we've got these two going at each other, and it's going to be an interesting matchup. So for Tercios, he's a good striker. He's got a lot of volume, and he puts together good combinations where he mixes everything together, his punches, his kicks, all that. But he doesn't have a ton of power in the hands. doesn't have a ton of power in the kicks. He's just going with the, that volume, that high output. Um, even so much so that sometimes even if he's just missing stuff, it looks like he's probably landing because he's just throwing a ton, and that's what we get from him. Um, good grappling. He's very active from his back. He looks for sweeps. That's what you like to see. Um, and he's got a ton of cardio to go along with it. I think he's probably got the better cardio of the two. Now, for Rosas, he's a fast starter. He wants to come out quick and get things done early. He doesn't like to play around, which is good. I do like that. But it could result in a cardio failure later in a fight. Um, he's got solid grappling. The takedown volume is there, and I think if he just starts that early, He's probably going to be able to get a few takedowns in that first round. Now it's just, can he maintain control at any point? He's got good transitions, and he's aggressively attacking submissions, which often can result in him losing position, but he's able to turn around, reshoot, uh, you know, transition through something better, look for a sweep himself. So he's able to just keep going at it aggressively, but he can only do it for so long. Striking, it's decent, right? It's just it's set up by the wrestling threat, because if you know that this guy wants that takedown, and all of a sudden he comes with an overhand, it's a good move. So, like, let me, for this, for example, earlier today in training, I'm recording this on Sunday. I was doing a little bit of training. My training partner knows that I want the fight to the mat, right? And my training partner that I was doing a little sparring with is a striker. So, after I had shot a ton of takedowns on this poor guy, he tired of defending takedowns. He's doing, he's getting better at it, which is good for him, but it sucks because now I'm like, man, I got I to find a way to get these takedowns. Instead, I start looking for the takedown to hit the overhand, like you see a lot of guys do. And then that opens up the takedowns again because all of a sudden you're landing the big overhand. Well, that overhand is set up by the, the wrestling, and it just goes hand in hand, and that's what you get. So for Rosas, if he starts early with these takedowns, I think he's going to get some. And if Tercios is able to sweep or get you know get back to his feet or whatever, as the fight drags on, Rosas is going to be able to you know open up the striking a little bit. But the problem, and he probably hits harder than Tercios. Tercios doesn't pack a big wallop in his shots; it's just volume, which is good wins you on the scorecards, but he's probably not going to knock out Rosas. So that leaves me at, does Rosas get the finish or win enough early on that he can win on in a three-round decision? 
before he gasses out? Or is the cardio of Tercios going to be the thing that gets it done for him? I'm going to side with Rosas. I think he's going to be able to get the takedowns early. I think he's got at least two rounds in him before he's going to be too worn out. And I do think he's going to have enough control in the situation to be able to stay heavy on top of Tercio. So I'm going with Rosas. Let me know what you think. He is still young in his career. He's just young in general. He's like 18, 19 still. He's still a teenager. So you got to take it for it with, you know, take it for a, for what it is. And at 18 or 19, I probably wouldn't be good in the UFC. So there's that. But let me know. I'll see you guys in prospects the- in the lightweight division. But first, you guys, you can get yourself one of these shirts or one of the other many, des- many designs that we have on the website, 138mma.company.site. Link is in the description below. Get yourself a shirt. They're pretty cool. And if you do, I will feature you in one of my full card breakdowns as long as you send me a photo of yourself in the shirt, of course, because otherwise I won't have that photo. So send me the photo, Instagram, Twitter, whatever. Send me a photo. You'll be featured in the videos. That's what we're talking about. So either way, let's get back to this breakdown. We got Francisco Prado. He's 12-1, and one, only 4-1 and one in the last five. Same thing on the other side for Zell Huber, 4-1 and one in the last five. But Zell Huber is... 14 and one on the career. So both of these guys, Daniel Zellhuber, Francisco Prado, only one loss apiece. Both guys are prospects. There's a crossroads point for them. UFC is trying to decide, hey, who do we keep pushing as a prospect and who do we kind of sink down into the mid card? That's where we're at. Let's start on the Prado side. Dude's kind of a Muay Thai style striker, right? He's got good striking, tons of power, good head kick, but his head doesn't move and that makes his striking defense a little bit lax. His Thai clinch though is very good and he's got good control from there. He can strike from there, he does a good job. He's got decent grappling, and he's a bit of a slammer. Likes to pick guys up, dump them hard, you know, drop them down. That's basically his option if the uh, the grappling isn't working. And once he gets to the fight to the mat, he's more looking to, to ground and pound than he is looking for, for submissions. His cardio does fade on him, and I think it's just because the style he fights in is all action. On the other side, Daniel Zellhuber. Daniel Zellhuber is a more, um, what's the word? He's more technical, more like uh, try to find his spots kind of striker. He's got good crisp combinations. He sticks his jab, uses his range really well, but he does have a nice head kick as well. Both these guys got really good head kicks. One guy doesn't move his head though, so keep that in mind. Uh, In the grappling department, he's a good grappler as well with very solid takedown defense. He seeks to finish with either ground and pound or submissions, and he'll kind of just take what you give him. But his front choke series is pretty solid, and I do like that about him as well. I've got to side with Zell Huber. Not because I think the the gap is massive here. I think this is a very close fight and go either way. But I'm going to take the guy that's got the better striking defense and still has the ability to put a guy out over the guy that is very good on offense but doesn't really have the defense. They're similar in the offensive output. They're similar in that. And I think that Zell Huber just has a few more tools in the tool bag. And I think he's probably going to land a head kick at some point. So I'm going to take Daniel Zell Huber. Not very confident in this one, though. Let me know what you guys think. Maybe you can sway me a little bit. JD did that last week, and it didn't work too well. But that's okay. JD, I forgive you, brother. All right, I'll see you guys in Folks, the next Folks, co-main event of the evening. And honestly, this one kind of feels like the main event to me. Um, and it's more or less because this fight now has a lot more implications in it now that we have a wide open featherweight division with the unfortunate loss of Alexander Volkanovsky. Um, and hopefully anybody that's on the Patreon happened to notice that I put it out in our little chat there that, you know, it might be a good, good idea to hedge out as we were up uh, 2.97 units going into the main event. Big bet on Volkanovski. Obviously, that didn't play out. So, hopefully you guys hedged out of that. If you did not, sorry about it. Uh, We're going to spread our units a little better this time. So, we've got that. If you want to check those out, they're on patreon.com slash 138MMA. You guys got it. I appreciate y'all for tuning in. Let's go and break this down. Like I said, the 145-pound division is a little bit more open now. So, Volkanovski's out. Sure, he'll probably get a rematch based on the way the first one went. His durability is in question. He's probably not getting it done, and that sucks. I hate to say that. I was really – he's the better fighter out of the two. He was landing the better shots, but he can't take it. He can't take those shots. The age is catching up to him. And, you know, like we said earlier on the card, we've learned our lesson. So either way, I'm going to have to say that this fight feels more like a main event. This fight has some serious title implications because the winner of this really puts themselves in line for a potential title shot. Now, sure, you got Max Holloway. You got this, that, and the other. but and yes, Max has a win over both these guys, but these guys would be option B, right? So that's why this is a bigger one. And, and when we get to the main event, you'll understand what I'm talking about with why those two maybe don't fit uh, as far as, uh, you know, a lot of title implications. But here we go. Let's break this down. I'm done talking about that. Uh, Brian Ortega takes on Yair Rodriguez. Now for Ortega, I should have wrote this up there. I didn't want to, you know, clutter the board. So uh, Ortega has been off for a long time. Uh, injury with, with the shoulder 
um, in the last fight with these two that ended kind of, you know, unceremoniously, but whatever. Uh, injury to the shoulder, the issues with his woman, uh, things didn't go well there, I guess, and that probably kept him out a little bit too, you know, whatever. But he's back, and Brian Ortega, who knows what, whether he's been improving a ton, whether he's about the same level as he was before, but we're going to go off of what we've seen, and that's the best that we can do when there's a long layoff. Kind of like we said with, with Paulo Costa, who, you know, in the last card, put on a good showing for himself. Robert Whitaker got it done, but we there was a lot of stuff where it was just kind of, we're inferring a lot of things that we just we just don't know for sure. Ortega's that same situation here, okay? Uh, but we do know that this dude is a solid grappler. That did not change. He's got a very large toolbox. He's got decent takedowns, and they tend to come after strikes now. So that's good because after that Max Holloway fight, when he when he you know had to learn how to how to strike, he started to learn how to put combinations together. He took some time off and actually did a really good job of getting better at striking. So now his takedowns come after strikes, whereas before they were more like jujitsu style takedowns. You know, he did okay with them, and he kind of needed the fight to the bat. But if he didn't get it, he was a fish out of water. Well, now he's picked up some striking. We'll cover that in a moment, but that does help him get the takedowns. He's got very slick transitions and very good control ability and a very, uh, very much a choke artist, right? Not, and I don't mean that like he chokes, oh man, you know, high, you know, high important situation he chokes, but he has, he has the arsenal of chokes that are going to, going to be his, his go-to, right? He's got other submissions, but the chokes are what he specializes in. Obviously the triangle being the nickname T-City that checks out, um, but he also has a very nasty guillotine. And we've seen him apply both of these quite a few times. You know, he's got, was it like seven wins by submission? No, maybe more. I don't know. He's got, he's got quite a few wins by submission. Let's put it that way. Uh, the triangle and the guillotine are the most prevalent. Those are what he looks for the most. Now, uh, for Brian Ortega, I'd say he's obviously going to be the, the better grappler skill for skill in this matchup. And I don't know why I wrote grappling twice. That's supposed to say striking. I'm a doofus. So we're going to... I don't know what I'm doing here. Guys, I'm new at this. The first day on the job. If you can't tell. There we go. It says striking now for everybody taking notes at home. If you couldn't just infer um use a different marker but you guys get it you understand so i'm a doofus we got good striking uh, he does put together good combinations now that's something that he really developed after that hallway fight like i said he's got a good front kick up the middle he's had this one for a while and it's kind of one of those things where he kind of comes down low and then throws that front kick up it's kind of weird kind of unorthodox but he uses it to cover distance and that front kick up the middle is a dangerous weapon for most grapplers that don't that aren't worried about being taken down so he's got a good front kick um, and the grappling threat does uh, set up that strike game because you know that if you get taken down by Brown Ortega, you're probably not going to be in the best position. So having to worry about that grappling threat sets up the hands. We saw that last weekend. Anthony Fluffy Hernandez getting it done for us, guys. Like I said, uh, Kapilov had to, to really worry about the grappling threat from Hernandez. So what happened there? Well, Hernandez was able to start landing some serious shots on the feet. That's just the way it works. If you have to constantly worry about the grappling, the strikes start to come up and then because you're constantly worried about defending that takedown. It's just, if you have to worry about defending multiple things, you're going to be worse at defending either of those things individually, right? So that's how that works. Either way, Brian Ortega, solid fighter, hasn't been around in a long time. Who knows? Uh, Yair Rodriguez, on the other hand, we've seen him more recently. Um, he did have that loss to Volkanovski. There was that like headbutt in there. It was kind of weird, but either way, Volkanovski was probably going to still win that fight. That was before, you know, he took the knockout loss to Islam. So uh, for Yair Rodriguez, dude's got solid striking. He's got a very dynamic attack. The thing that is probably his best is that he can just put that, that whole arsenal together. The kicks, punches, knees, elbows, spins, like all sorts of wild stuff. He's got absolutely deadly kicks to all levels, and he's going to mix everything together like I mentioned. He's got good footwork to go along with it, but sometimes his striking defense does, uh, you know, falter because he's too – too worried about throwing this, this like dynamic offense, which can be an issue. I don't know that it is in this fight though, because although Brian Ortega has improved in the striking, he's still not like an elite level striker. And obviously Yair Rodriguez is going to be the better striker, much like Ortega is going to be the better grappler. Now, good grappling on the side of uh, Yair Rodriguez. It's clear he's learning the grappling a little bit more uh, as a focus nowadays, right? He's got a growing submission arsenal. He's very active from his back, but the problem is his takedown defense and ability to get back up is something to worry about. So for me, this matchup comes down to, do I think Brian Ortega gets the takedowns consistently? Because yes, I do think Rodriguez can survive on the ground in instances. I just don't think if he spends the entire, you know, 15 minutes on the, on the mat, or most of it anyway, he's going to have much success. But if he's on the ground for bits of time, I do think that Rodriguez can survive. On the feet, do I think that Ortega can survive on the feet with, with Rodriguez? 
Yeah, I mean, for instances, you know, for a while. But if he's if he's got to spend the whole 15 minutes on the feet, Rodriguez is probably going to put a serious beating on Ortega. So how do I feel like this one goes? Well, I've got to take Yair Rodriguez. The long layoff concerns me for Ortega. The fights start on the feet. So initially, Ortega is going to have to find a way to get the fight to the mat. And I think Rodriguez is dangerous enough that even if it does get to the mat, Ortega is going to have to take to have that little bit of what if I don't get this one in the back of his mind, especially if he eats a couple of kicks or something like that prior to getting that first takedown. Then the next time he goes for a takedown, it's going to be there. So I'm going to take Yaya Rodriguez. I think whoever wins this fight will probably make it look fairly easy because it's going to be done in their world. But I spent a ton of time on this one. Let me know who you have in the comments. I'll see you guys in the main event. So we've made it to the main event. So last reminder, if you do me that favor, like this video. Go ahead and scroll on down. Hit that for me. I appreciate it very much. Let's break this down. Brandon fights Brandon in the flyweight division. Brandon Royval takes on Brandon Moreno in the rematch. The first matchup between these two ended, well, due to an arm injury, which I believe they ruled as a TKO, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but the arm injury happened in the fight, so it is what it is. Uh, Moreno got the win in that fight. It was an action-packed fight up until that point. And this is what we got. We got the rematch. Brandon Moreno winning the first. Brandon Royval now stepping in short notice after Amir Albazi falls out of this matchup. So good matchup, though. <clears throat> Both guys. Three and two in the last five fights. I don't really know where this fight leaves them, which is why I said that the, the co-main event feels more like the main event to me, just because I don't really know where they go after this because both guys have lost to the current champion, Alessandra Pantoja, multiple times. I believe three times for Moreno, two if you don't count the ultimate fighter, uh, and two for Rival. So, I mean, how many times can you lose to the champion before they say, you know, we got to put somebody fresh in there? Uh, so I don't really know where this leaves them, right? Now, I understand that there's not a lot of people in the division that Pantoja hasn't beaten. So maybe they do get another shot, but it is what it is. Either way, let's break this down. For Brandon Royval, he's a very chaotic fighter, right? He's very kill or be killed, and he's going to find himself in a brawl when it's on when he's on the feet. Because of that, he can be very dangerous. He's got good elbows and knees. He's got a ton of volume to go along with it. Um, the variety of offense is probably his best weapon, right? He's going to come forward with just different stuff, whether he's spinning, coming forward with, you know, clean just combinations that he can use, like, He's got it all, he's, he's, but it's frantic, it's chaotic, it's wild, which is good for his style, and it's going to be interesting to see how that matches up, hopefully over a full fight, whether that be an early finish or not, a full fight, and we don't get like a freak arm injury. Yes, I understand it was caused in the fight, you get what I'm saying, but either way, hopefully we can see how these two match up, because we've got a more polished striker on the other side, we're going to, we're going to get into that in a bit. It's not that Roy Vall's striking isn't polished, but it's polished, it's like a... It's a, it's, it's, I wouldn't say, it's, I guess it's not polished. It's just, it's good. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to make that it sounds like it's bad because it's good and it's effective. It's very effective, but it's not your traditional, like if you saw him doing this stuff on a heavy bag, you'd be like, what's this guy doing? But it works in a fight. So that's, that's what I'm getting at. royval has got a very good style in chaos and that's what happens here, right? Uh, so striking, I do like it a lot from Royval in most of his fights. He's, he's, he's toned it down a little as of late, but you know what I mean? His uh, jujitsu. I think he's probably going to be the uh, more more dangerous on the mat in this matchup between the two. Uh, he's got very, very uh, dangerous submissions. Let's put it that way. He's aggressively attacking them. A big arsenal of submissions. He's got them choking arms. You've heard me talk about choking arms. But he is submission over position. And a lot of that kind of comes because he's always just attacking, you know, the neck or, you know, an arm or whatever. He's going for the submissions constantly, and he'll lose position because of that. But he can get submissions from the back, from the top, from wherever. It is a good job about it. So I don't fault him too much for that. It is, it can be good because you're going for the finish. It can be bad because you lose position. His takedown defense isn't the best, but I think that's because he's fine with working on the mat because jujitsu is very dangerous and a lot of people aren't going to want to go down to the ground with him. So all in all, Roy Vall is a very offense, not a whole lot of defense type of fighter. On the other side, Brandon Moreno. Dude is a very slick striker, right? He's got mostly boxing, but he's started implementing the kicks a little bit more lately. Uh, not that he didn't use them before, but he's used them more as of late, if that makes sense. Um, the guy's got beautiful combinations. Something I really like is that he doubles up the same side. So that might be like a jab to a lead hook, right? Or like a hook to an uppercut off the same hand or something wild like that. Or reverse, uppercut to a hook. Something like that, but off the same hand. You know, maybe he'll come, come with that cross and then slap in that uppercut as you try to duck under. He uses the same side and doubles it up, and that's not something a lot of fighters do. That is a very high-level uh, skill that he's got, especially because he has these quick hands. So he's able to do that and still put them together and not make it seem slow. Because if you haven't been like a striker in your life, guys, if you haven't done that, 
you can you can work this along with me right now. Okay, set your phone or your laptop off. Give yourself a little space. You don't punch it. But if you throw your your punch to get your the reason people often throw the other hand is because as this one's coming back, the other hand's here, right? Or the uh, the inverse is true. But when you throw the same hand, you can't really generate a ton of force by throwing this hand from out here. So you have to bring it back some. So to be and maybe not all the way, but some at least. So you have to hear and then get the hip moving, get you know whatever. But if your if your hands aren't super fast, that's going to seem like a very slow combination. A guy like Brandon Moreno makes it quick and makes it hard to hard to predict. So that's that's kind of why he gets the ranking of like a, a solid striker. He's very high. He's a high level striker. Let's put it that way. Um, he's going to draw out his opponent strikes. That might not come into play here just for the fact that Roy Ball is going to be striking already. Uh, so he's not drawing a whole lot out. But he is pretty good with the counters, whether it's because he's drawing them out or he's just countering anyway. He works the body well, both with punches and kicks, and he's extremely durable. We've seen him take a beating. However, at, at some point, those durable guys, we've seen it a lot lately, where the, the most durable fighters just start to crack. So either way, he's shown durability up to this point. Tough guy, been able to eat whatever has come his way, and he's a very good striker. In the grappling, he's very good there as well. I would give the edge to Roy Vall, but he is good, and he can hit, hold, uh, hold his own. He's mixed in takedowns pretty well as of late. Um, he's good at taking the back, and when he does get your back, he has very good control from there. He does also have the choking arms. You see that a lot at 125 pounds. Guys with just long, skinny arms. It's good for slipping under the throat, right? It's just it's what they're good for. As you get bigger, your arms get thicker. And as you get your arms get thicker, sure, you might have a tighter squeeze, but it's hard to get under the chin. So either way, uh, tough matchup. Either guy could win. Um, I'm tempted by the under, but at the same time, it's a three and a half. And three and a half round lines are hard because... Three and a half is kind of that, like, that's pretty late in the fight. And the value gets lost a little bit because it's not like a two and a half. Like a two and a half, you can usually get a little more value on it than a three and a half. And three and a half, like, you're getting into the fourth round. And by the fourth round, not, there are fights that end in the fourth round. Don't get me wrong. Or in the fifth round. But there's not, usually if you get past the third round, you're probably going to decision. Usually. So the three and a half lines are tough. I don't know, but I'm going to I'm gonna lean Moreno for the pick. Uh, partially because he won the first one. Partially because I think this fight's going to end up on the feet more often than not. And I think he's just a little bit cleaner there. Um, and then, you know, partially because he's the guy that, you know, was ready for this fight originally, right? He was already preparing for the fight. Home turf for him. It's in Mexico. So you got that. Brandon Roy Vall is not from Mexico. Um, so you have that. So I'm going to take Brandon Moreno. I think it's a pretty close fight, though. And I think either guy could win. And either guy could get a finish here. So let me know what you think, though. Could get a decision. It's it's a tough one to call the length of the fight. That I don't I don't like that one. So I think I'm gonna stay away from that. But Moreno's the pick. Haven't placed a bet on it. Let me know what you have. Are you heavy on one side? Do you really like one of these? And thank you guys for watching this video. Like it if you haven't done it already. I tried to tell you that before. See you guys in the next video.